Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our Aerospace Education Legislative Advocacy Panel. That's a mouthful. Uh, but before we get started, I kind of want to introduce myself a little bit and tell you how I got involved in working with aerospace. You know, I have been a teacher of English and debate for over 25 years in South Florida. But I'm also the co-founder of Aerospace and Innovation Academy along with Kevin Simmons. And our purpose is to provide unique and distinctive STEM opportunities for middle, high school, and even university now students who are coming back and really working with our own students. And part of that is, is to provide a passion track, if you will. Some of our students, as you've seen from these presentations, are engineers. Some are entrepreneurs starting uh, satellite funding mechanisms, but some are interested in the policy work, the legislative advocacy that must be done in order to ensure that the work of aerospace here in our state of Florida is happening. Not only advocating, but even legislating. And so that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. Um, when I came to meet Kevin, we were working at that same small school that you kind of heard about with that first CubeSat that was developed. And I would sit in my class and my debate students would say things like, yeah, we're building these CubeSats. I didn't know what they were. But they also started to get to the point where they were speaking about their exploits in public, whether it was City Hall, and eventually we were going up to our state's capital there in Tallahassee, and even to DC to start advocating on behalf of space policy for some of the programs that Kevin will share with you today. Things like the Legislative Blitz through the AIAA, and Florida's Space Day that occurs every year in Tallahassee. But we even were being asked to speak at places like the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as NASA headquarters. And that's kind of where I came into play. While Kevin was teaching them the content of really building satellites, I started working with the students to help them to feel comfortable speaking about what they were doing. So imagine the engineer of the future, someone who's comfortable being able to talk also about their, their incredible knowledge. We call it the talkies and the techies. And from that, the policy aspect of our program has really come into play. We had some success legislatively working with, at the time, Congressman uh, Brian Mast, who is our federal representative. He helped our students in time, resolution 109, to increase awareness that launch initiative. What was beautiful really about this was like the students were building CubeSats, this allowed my debate team who was saying, how come other students don't get to do this kind of work to kind of take their passion about legislation and being congr you know, congressmen in the chambers, if you will, in a debate tournament and taking that into the real world. And so his office has worked with us and our students to develop that legislation. And our students really got to understand the legislative process and how cumbersome that can be at times. And in fact, we were there at the White House, or sorry, in, at Congress when he introduced that on the House floor. And it was really a highlight for our students to be able to see that come to fruition. The following year, he came to our school to announce the reintroduction of that because we've learned very quickly that just because legislation is introduced does not mean that it is passed. And so in 2019, you can see that it changed into H.R. 85, which essentially was to recognize the importance of CubeSats as a disruptive educational model in the classroom. Now we're trying to focus our efforts at the state level, and of course COVID has slowed things down a little bit, but today I'm really excited to, this is the kind of opening of our policy leg again with the Aerospace and Innovation Academy, and I'm very excited today to share the stage with some incredible folks. Joining us today, we call uh, Representative Thad Altman, who of course represents this beautiful area of Brevard at the state, but he's also the uh, president of the AMF here and is this, responsible for this amazing building. So we'll give him a quick round of applause, before we allow him to participate today as well. Joining him is, of course, Michael McCotty. And Michael McCotty is a freshman at American Heritage High School. He's been with the Wolfpack CubeSat development team for some time, and he will be leading our policy efforts now that we are coming out of COVID. Uh, particularly, we hope to be working with Representative Altman in the future for some potential Florida legislation. Also joining my round of applause for Michael, sorry. Next to Michael is Amy Trujillo. Trujillo, I'm saying that right now. She is not only an amazing science educator, a STEM coordinator here in Orlando, but she's the outgoing president of FLAG, which is the Florida Association of the Gifted. Because the students that we work with, while often gifted, often also have twice exceptionalities. And so understanding and advocating at the state level for education 
and STEM education in particular in our state is incredibly important. So she'll be here representing that as well. N round of applause for Amy. Next to Amy, we have Owen Welch, who has also, he was a former member of the Wolfpack, still kind of is, he's at the university now, uh, University of Florida, you may have heard him present yesterday, he's working on the Lunar Dust Project that uh, is bringing many of our university students together. Both Owen and Michael have been part of these policy initiatives and these, uh, these advocacy movements of working on teams with younger students, so they're going to share with you a little bit about how those experience to help shape their lives today, and of course, you all recognize the man on the end, of course, Kevin Simmons. Uh, uh, oh, a round of applause. Sorry, Owen. <laughs> Kevin Simmons is operating today in the capacity, it's a different hat, right, of uh, representing the Florida team captain for the AIAA in uh, getting students and university members together to go and advocate uh, at, in D.C. He also helps us to organize for Florida Space Day. So I'm going to be moderating today just a few questions that I'll be asking of our group, but this is also a time for you to ask questions. So I'm going to exit the stage, and uh, if you have a question at any time during this, please feel free to stand up and I'll come to you with those. Kevin, I want to start with you, if you could kind of share with us a little bit about maybe the difference between, you know, we think about lobbying, right, but that's really not what advocacy is. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you came to be involved with having students uh, get involved? Absolutely. Uh, I came into education not, I was not originally trained to be an educator. I'm a biochemist, so that's what's both ironic and awesome about um, being so involved with aerospace is it's not where I started. When I started teaching, I wanted to do something very disruptive and I wanted to do as much aerospace as I could. And my simple advice for educators, find whatever your passion is, put that into your classroom. Whatever you, whatever you most love, that should be that theme that you use as much as you can. So. Early on in 2002, I, I believe I was the first high school teacher to get a research grant from the Florida Space Grant Consortium. I didn't realize no teachers had ever gotten it. It normally goes to university professors. I, have, I cannot thank Dr. J.D. Mukherjee, the Space Grant Consortium director enough because he literally gave me my first shot to do real aerospace. So a couple of years passes and he goes, Kevin, every year the directors from all the states have to go to Congress. We basically have to beg for our budget. So Congress normally allocates about 50% of what they need to do their work. And then if the directors don't go and sort of remind them and harangue them and make a good case, then they'll just leave at 50% funding. So he said, Kevin, I want you to go and I want you to be an example of what good use our grant was. And I said, J.D., why don't we take one of our 14 year olds and let them go? So I actually took this young man named Harry Baswani and we went with Jay Deep on behalf of the Florida, the NASA Space Grant Consortium to make sure Congress wouldn't short them on their budget. When I saw how well Harry, how well he was received by the legislators, it became very apparent that students, this is how we get real world, we get the students to go on behalf of their own interests to advocate. So that was in about 2005 or six. So I started taking my students in a very small way to call and visit my congressman. Uh, and then when I, I met uh, Shauna, we ended up with teams like Owen and Michael and the young ladies you see on the screen. We, we call on all 29 Florida offices in a day and a half. So we have three teams, they get about 10 meetings each. They build their dossiers. They learn about what are the priorities for each office. It's, it's very strategic and planned. And then they go and advocate. And when they know bill numbers and they know how to speak articulately about real world legislation, that is very impactful. Kevin, before I turn it over to the representative today, um, can you explain the difference between advocacy? Like what is its goal when you're advocating on behalf of say space policy versus say lobbying? While not an expert, I can share with you, a lobbyist is someone that is paid on behalf of an entity to represent that entity, whether it be a company, uh, whatever. Advocates are folks like us. We are not paid. We are literally going and trying to persuade our legislative bodies to do what we think is right or important and, and push what we want versus um, say being paid to do it. So that's a real clear, if you're, if you're unfamiliar, advocate versus a, a lobbyist. 
Great, thanks. Representative Altman, I want to turn it over to you now because I got to meet you. I was on one of these trips where we were taking our students up to talk with you at Florida Space Day. And it was an incredible moment for me, not only kind of piggybacking with working with my debate students, but actually seeing the legislative process in action. How did you feel as a representative with us coming into the room or when you see students there? And I guess feel free to take it wherever you want, but are we as citizens just allowed to actually speak with our representatives, right? You seem so hands off in our minds, I think, at times. I'm going to stand because I feel like that podium is blocking this part of the crowd. <laughs> sure. yep. um, me sitting there. First, I want to thank uh, you guys for what you've done in this, uh, this weekend uh, conference for CubeSat. It's phenomenal. It's actually wonderful. What a great job. And it, it's probably the most exciting thing happening in education is actually launching hardware to space. I mean, it just doesn't get better than that. What well, does when you start launching students to space, right? And, um, or teachers, but well, we've already launched at least one teacher. And of course, Christy McAuliffe was one that we tragically lost. And that really was the beginning of the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. Uh, we, when we realized after the Challenger, we had no place to memorialize fallen astronauts. And this is what we call our living memorial. We have our granite memorial just out there. And this is our living memorial where we inspire the next generation of rocket scientists and astronauts. But being a state legislature in today's space world is really, really an interesting time. It used to be when I first ran for local and state office, I'd talk about the importance of space, space and people would say, ah, oh, you're a state rep. What's that got to do with space? Ah, oh, you're just blowing smoke. It's a federal thing. Well, not anymore. Uh, with, with commercialization of space and the decentralization of space, private companies, local governments, and state governments are intimately involved in space activities. And there's a lot of competition. Competition between companies, competition between municipalities, counties, and states. And so, as, a, as an elected official here in the state of Florida, uh, we play an extremely large role in space. Uh, first and foremost, infrastructure. It's really infrastructure intensive to launch in space. The, the, the uh, supply chain, the road infrastructure, uh, natural gas, uh, the, the propellants that we use to power our rockets between natural gas, kerosene, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, providing infrastructure, uh, location for launch um, pads, uh, we're seeing more and more uh, uh, more need of additional launch pads. Just saw the sign, I think, when I drove in. We've launched 40 sometimes this year. We hope to get over 60. Um, the Space Force tells me they're preparing a range to launch as many as, are you ready? How many, how many do you think what they're preparing? Anybody have any guess? You gotta have a guess. 100, very good, close. Three to 400 launches a year. We're preparing a, a launch center to, to launch three to 400 launches a year. They're looking to us as a state to provide infrastructure to help support that. Probably our number one priority is education and workforce. We need to really come to the table and provide a workforce to meet those incredible launch demands and the launch and the demands of colonization and space and other planets and exploration and hardware. So infrastructure, providing workforce development, a tax structure that really isn't conducive. We like to feel like we're the most friendly state in the union. We want to be even friendlier um, to provide a tax structure that encourages companies to launch here. We have a concept that I support and I hope we pursued further. It's called zero G, zero fee. If you're launching stuff in space, wow, you shouldn't have to pay tax on that, should you? I mean, that's hard enough to do as it is, and we want to encourage more of that. So that's important as well, that we provide that. So we have a lot to do as from, from the point of view as policymakers for space. And we want to encourage uh, young people to go into STEM. That's why conf conferences like this are so important, and real life experience and hands-on STEM experience. One thing we're looking at, we've done, is we want to provide more tuition assistance for students who choose those very difficult and highly needed academic pursuits like physics, 
uh, like mathematics, like engineering, pre-med. Uh, we need to provide more incentive to students who, to go in those design fields, and that's something that we're looking at doing. Maybe a, what we call a, a super frag, so flower resident access grant. So those are the four things that four things we're working on. So how did how did it feel for you? We really appreciate that update, by the way. But when we brought those students in, right? Like I was kind of getting to the 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 idea of when I was first meeting you, right? I didn't realize that average citizens can actually come and talk with their legislators. So when you see students coming in and advocating, like on Space Florida, uh, what is that like for a representative like yourself? Well, yeah, so we have a very open form of government, as you can see. You can go and actually participate and be a part of and watch uh, the policymaking process, the lawmaking process in Tallahassee, and even meet your, meet your elected officials and attend the committee meetings and watch the sessions and even testify in committee uh, if time permits, but also uh, to see your local elected officials and just as important as their staff back in the district before session. We have a 30-day session. It's very intensive. Do not underestimate, underestimate the power and the importance of staff. Um, Angelique Rinaldi, my legislative staff, is here. Raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and so, um, so we, um, we try to be as open and get as much public input as possible. We, we really appreciate that. I'm going to turn it over to Amy now. You also... Um, obviously work with the gifted population and education is particularly important, something that also needs to advocate. Can you share with us a little bit about why we even need to advocate for our gifted and exceptional students at a time where we assume that they're just automatically going to be, you know, succeeding rather? Oh, wow. So, that's a really good question. And that is oh, so important. Oh, we're going to let Amy answer that because she's okay. also on the oh, panel. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank well, you. I agree with her. Yes. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Um, so our main thing is just like when they went up to, you know, going up and seeing everybody, it's the same thing for our gifted students. We've gone and had, you know, sessions with our people. We've talked to people and they've seen, oh, our students can do these things. So as early as kindergarten, some of our students are already way past their teachers. And so advocating for the hands-on STEM, advocating for programs like this gives them opportunity to make a good change in the world and not become like an evil scientist on a, on a cartoon. So we're trying to guide our students into the right paths, into the right, you know, like saying you're undecided right now, here are all these opportunities. There's, there's different things you can do to drama, you can do to the CubeSats, but giving students opportunities and letting parents and teachers and educators and then legislators know that our students can do these things at an incredible young age. No, that's really important because, again, the population oftentimes that we started working with were students who are gifted academically, but you come to learn very quickly that students have exceptionalities as well, and we need to make sure that their needs are being met. And we feel that's being done through the building of those CubeSats as well as being able to advocate for aerospace. So I want to kind of turn it over to Owen a little bit. Uh, I know you were a student. in the. Did you start in the eighth grade, the seventh grade, when you started advocating for space policy? Uh, the eighth grade was my first year. The eighth grade, right? He was also a debater on our team, so he was part of that process. He came in right about the time we had been uh, working on the legislation with um, Brian Mast at the time, so he kind of got the excitement that was involved there. But tell us what your experiences were as a student trying to prepare for a legislative briefing with these really important people in our community. So yeah, it was really stressful the first time around because I didn't know what it was going to be like advocating to them and I didn't know what I actually needed to do. But I was working with students who had been there before. So I learned about how you had to reach out, schedule the meetings, get all the information together on the people that you're meeting with so that you know how to appeal to them correctly. Um, but a lot of that stress was lifted off my shoulders when I actually went and spoke to these representatives and saw how willing they were to at the very least, hear us out, and how some of them were actually proponents of the aerospace industry themselves. And they were working with us, we just needed to keep the ideas that we felt were important on the top of their minds. But yeah, it turned very quickly from a feeling of stress to one of relief and almost inspiration once I spoke to them. 
One of the things that uh, I helped the students with, and Michael, you'll remember too, is that we would have lunch meetings where we had to kind of look at what were called talking points. So your students end up learning these talking points in order to meet with the representatives, things like workforce development, uh, education, and so forth. So Michael, let me kick it over to you now as a, as a student who's also benefited. What was your talking point that you kind of had to specialize on, and how did you even prepare? So um, the first time I did, um, I advocated um, in space on space day mm -hmm. for space florida right? yeah. and um basically my part was research and development so the biggest part about that was our setting up programs to bring new companies into the state of florida and for them to develop new technologies and the biggest part about that is that um there's more jobs in the nation but also the government is able to tax um those companies and that creates more funding, which can be used for other purposes. And I mean, as a sixth grader, I definitely was, I barely even knew what research and development was, let alone in the aerospace industry. So um, a big part of that was the other groups. There were a lot of seventh and eighth graders who basically explained the concepts to me. And then um, at home and during the lunch times, I would have to do my best to understand them. And then we would go back and talk to each other and that's basically how we would learn the topics. So when I think back to us both, you know, we've been to DC together, Owen, and certainly to Tallahassee, how would you describe maybe some of those challenges uh, that you might have either leading teams, because both of you have gone on to lead teams now. So now not only have you been team members, but you've gone on to lead these visits. So what are some of the, the difficulties with that? We'll start with Owen. Um, yeah, so it was definitely different transitioning from being a student following someone to being a leader because you now have to organize all the meetings yourself, uh, you, well, a little bit of assistance from those who know more, but you have to organize the meetings, you have to send the emails, you have to get in contact with some of these legislators who are sometimes difficult to get into contact with. And on top of that, you have to make sure your team members know all of their talking points. So like Ms. Christensen said, there are three major talking points, um, education, uh, research and development, and then enhancing the STEM workforce, I believe. Yes. No. Um, workforce development. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's been a little bit. But uh, so you have to make sure that your team knows all of their talking points and everyone else's talking points. So that way it can be a fluid conversation when you're in there, not just reciting and regurgitating information. You want to look like you know what you're talking about and hopefully know what you're talking about. So there was a little bit more work that came with being a leader. Kevin, with regards to these talking points that the students are mentioning, uh, do they differ from organization? Because you mentioned advocacy is really about the, the aerospace organizations. Right. Uh, what's been very helpful is, let's say an entity like Space Florida might provide, or someone would do research and say, these are the bills that are being considered. Here's sort of a maybe a pro-con or just a very factual uh, a brief explanation of the bill, and then of course you can go to the actual bill online. What's nice, uh, I'm the Florida captain for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Congressional Visits Day, so they have a nice one-pager. They'll, they'll put out a one-pager so that we all speak with one voice. So it's very important when you're representing uh, individuals or companies when you're an advocate, you're, you're really not just pushing for, I'm Boeing and I only care about what Boeing needs or I'm Lockheed Martin. What you really want to do is you, you want to agree on some common values and, and bills that benefit everyone. So having some literature from, for instance, AIAA headquarters, um, that's very important. Number two, they would give us uh, data on the economic impact uh, of aerospace, for instance, in Florida. So we knew how many jobs, we knew, uh, we knew by county how many businesses existed, we knew how much uh, revenue was coming in from all of those. So those are very helpful tools to pass along to our students. And what I should add with Owen and Michael and all the folks on the screen, there's only two of us. Sean and I are in DC and we have three teams. So one team had to go get to the right spot, carry out their meeting on their own. We, we would float between the three teams but this gave them some autonomy and, and some uh, a chance to do their own thing. The great thing you heard here is when Michael was a sixth grade, he needed the older kids to show him what to do. By the time they got to the eighth grade, they're the leader of their team. They're competing to be the leaders. They want that responsibility. This is the right way to let them exercise that. 
speaking of workforce development, I want to put this back to Representative Altman. You know, obviously, workforce development, the idea of aerospace is a great industry here in the state of Florida. Um, and it always is one of those talking points that we see. Can you tell us a little bit more about, from your perspective, uh, why we need to invest in the idea of the aerospace industry here as far as workforce development is concerned? And then feel free to extemporize as well about how we could start even earlier in education to kind of help build that pipeline towards that workforce development to keep our kids here in Florida. It's important we invest. We can't take our place and space for granted. We are here because of our, we're blessed with a really good geographic location. And because we came here uh, in the 50s, late 40s, we've developed a strong base of, of intellectual and academic might, as well as infrastructure. But we could lose that. We can't take it for granted. It's very competitive. Many other countries and states are investing a lot in space, especially when you look at uh, areas like Texas that have coastal regions that are good for launch. So it's important we, we not take what we have for granted. It's so much a part of who we are, our purpose, uh, our, what, why we feel we are here uh, in Florida to, to lead in space. So it's uh, something we need to continue to be diligent about. Well, right, and we heard in some of the presentations yesterday, right, kids are excited about aerospace early on, and then we tend to lose them, particularly girls in the field, by the time they're in middle school and, and beyond that. So, Amy, I'm kind of going to direct this one to you with regards to education then. Why is something like experiential learning, building CubeSats, creating legislation so important for our gifted students in particular and, and all of our students really across the state of Florida? So for our students, if they don't know it, if they don't see it, if they don't know it's out there, then they, again, they don't know it's out there. And so bringing those things in, even an elementary level and showing them some of the things they've done. So it's like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. So going to competitions, going to see the launches, go, coming here, you know, getting them to come to conferences like this, they realize that things are actually out there and more than just their community, their neighborhood. So it's a bigger world. So they see a, the bigger picture. And I think you're right. Like even my eyes were open just by taking some of these trips and going, my gosh, I guess even people who just teach English actually have a role in what's going on in aerospace industry. Like just being able to talk about it, to write about it. And certainly beyond that, just knowing these things exist is something that we, we spend too much time, I think, in our classrooms as opposed to going outside of those classrooms to see what's there. Michael, you're going to be leading our new legislative efforts now that we hope COVID is behind us. Why are you choosing policy as a route for something you want to focus your, your high school on? I mean, you're just getting started, and what, what is your reasoning for that? Well, um, I mean, I did speech and debate in middle school, and there were some difficult times where um, I really didn't, I really didn't understand maybe the researching process or the speech writing, but I feel like that struggle has um, given me the certain tools um, in order to advocate for certain policies. And I feel like um, students advocating for policy, it not only builds um, skills within the student group, but it is a way to make a difference for um, society. And um, it has a greater effect than just um, students, but it also, those students are the future of our country and our state, which make an impact on the workforce. So I feel like um, the biggest thing about policy that inspired me was how my peers and I could make a difference, not only for us, but for other students as well. And yeah. That's really important. Um, we're winding down a little bit, but I want to mention specifically um, Space Day again, Representative Altman and, and Space Florida. Can, can you tell us a little bit about their role in uh, the state legislature? And then Amy, I'm going to piggyback after that and talk about how does FLAG also have something like a Space Florida? So we'll start with the representative. A little bit about Space Florida. Space Florida is given the statutory authority to be an advocate for space uh, here in the state of Florida. They've been given the, uh, the legislative uh, jurisdiction for developing policies that help promote space, bring businesses to help build infrastructures here in the st state of Florida. The, um, the Florida Department of DOT is also, and somewhat unique to Florida, we actually provide dollars to the Department of Transportation to build space infrastructure, and they work very closely with Space Florida to build uh, space infrastructure, which we acknowledge now that uh, that's a part of transportation space. So there's a real emphasis on infrastructure as well. 
So they meet every year, and they they uh, we converge and we meet you in Tallahassee. So, or will we be back face to face this year? Do you know? Is that the plan? Uh, I know you're not necessarily representing Space Florida, but well, we'll they will put on uh, Space Day again in the legislature. I think they meet monthly. Uh, they're in a, uh, a voluntary board. The lieutenant governor is the chairman, but they will be. I'm not sure which date that, that yeah. they'll have yeah, it this year, but it will begin this year. And, Feb it's February usually around 14th. February, Great. Valentine's Day, because there's, there's always yeah. like a connection there with that. Uh, Amy, what about FLAG? Do they have an annual day that they kind of go and converge? Yes. So in the past, we have gone. We've worn our little scarves and we're orange for gifted. And so we've talked about the importance of gifted, but it's been slowed down for a few years because, yeah. you know, traveling and safety and everything. But it's definitely coming up. So all the students that are sitting in here that either want to come down or from Florida and want to come with us because showing stuff like this is part of gifted education. So it's not just about a special classroom or pulling a kid out. It's about giving these experiences and how important it is. So yes, we're definitely going. Perfect. Our final question, Representative Altman, is really for those students in the room who may be interested in, you know, having a legislative voice. What advice would you have, As and this will be kind of my last question, I'll open it up to anyone in the audience at that point. What advice would you have from somebody who speaks on our behalf for our students who might want to follow in your footsteps one day? I, um, to know your legislature and to know the process by which we govern uh, also, to have a clear understanding of what your passion is and what you believe and how and what you want to advocate for. It all begins with that a passion, whether it's space, the environment, education, health care. Um, really, really listen to your, your desires and your ambitions, and you're going to be a much stronger advocate, advocate when it's something that you truly care about and passionate about. We appreciate that. Are there any questions for anyone on the panel today? Anyone at all? Now is your chance. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Just stand up if you have a question. I'll come by with the mic. Hello. Uh, this is for uh, Representative Altman. Uh, just a piece of advice, really. Uh, we talked about, uh, you talked about incentivizing uh, the kids to take the hard stuff in, in college when I have you. Um, I'm in a kind of a unique position. I teach technology education. Uh, and one of the things you need to do is look at not just the engineers and the physicists, but the skilled tradespeople. Uh, we can't forget them. I, I talked to the people up at NASTAR Center in Philadelphia at Guyer Space Flight Center. They need, number one, pipe fitters, machinists, electricians, all those people to make this stuff that we're sending in space. So we really have to remember them when we're, when we're doing this. And, and honestly, I, you know, looking for my kids for careers, you know, 20 year old kid making $75,000 a year isn't too bad. So we also, in addition to, to encouraging, yeah, we, we think about it as academics, getting the kids to go to university and what have you. We can't really forget those skilled trades people. We talk about infrastructure, well, they're it. A very good point. We've appropriated hundreds of millions of dollars into trades and technical training and skills. It's been a top priority. And we also know that a lot of our great engineers, even astronauts, really began as technicians, uh, as mechanics, and actually working with their hands. Uh, they make better engineers because they've actually built things. So we have grossly underestimated those, those skills, and our goal is to be number one in the nation in technical education in the next five to seven years. I could also add that um, Eastern Florida State College is one of our exhibitors, and they have a world-class aerospace technician program they literally told me they cannot make enough graduates fast enough because of the need. So we're, we, it's a, I'm really glad Eastern Florida State College is here, but your point is welcome to There are no other questions. Well, we want to thank each and every one of you for being part of this panel today. And Representative Altman, if you have any other things that you'd like to say any at all about the AMF or anything that's going on with legislation that you'd like to share, this would be a great time if you'd like not to put you on the spot, but it's up to you. Well, my biggest point is thank you for being here uh, and have an interest in a Sunday morning. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, I, I, I say this all the time. It's not kerosene, natural gas, hydrogen that fuels our rockets. It's brain power. Uh, so this is the most important thing that we, we can be doing is creating the talent and inspiring those to, to keep this dream alive. Thank you. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you so much.
We're going to take uh, another break now, right? For Nope, I am incorrect. I have been finger-wagged. <laughs> you want that back? We, we have one more presentation, and then we're going to take a break, our, our final break. And I really do appreciate the panelists, and I appreciate uh, uh, Shauna for moderating. Let's see. So now our, our presentation, uh, this is a very interesting group. Uh, when I first got involved with CubeSets, this was the high school, the first high school to my knowledge that had launched a CubeSat. I don't think I was envious, but I looked to them and I said, okay, what did they do? What did they do well? I was fortunate enough to have a friend that taught at this high school in Northern Virginia. And they're our third and final virtual presenter today. Um, they are uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, High School for Science and Mathematics in Northern Virginia. And uh, Chris, if you could, uh, if you could load them up. Good morning, Kristen. Hi, good morning, everybody. So here, let me see if I can get our um, slides going here as well. Uh, I'm, as we're waiting here, uh, my name's Kristen Cusco. I'm from the Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, where I am the robotics director. Um, I've had the privilege of being the sponsor of the team, uh, the CubeSat team since 2019. So I got it right before COVID and, um, it kind of went dormant for a little bit just because of you know the whole COVID thing. But now we're, we were able to finish our, our latest uh, CubeSat, which is TJ Reaver. Uh, it's a 2U CubeSat that we will be deploying on SpaceX 26 here in November. It's gonna be launching from Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we'll be deploying from the International Space Station hopefully sometime in November as well. And while um, I've had a, it's, it's been just such a joy to work on this with the students, the real stars of the show are the students. So along with me today are Koi Din, uh, Pranav Vadi, and uh, Arthur Perdias. Uh, they're all our students who have been working so hard on this for the past year. And again, I would like to uh, share the stage with them. So give me one second so I can get the um, slides going. Because my slides disappeared. Um, give me, Koi, do you happen to have the slides? I had them up, but then they fell down. They went away. Um, I can see if I can present it. Give me one second. Can you see my screen or? I can now, yes. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So Ms. K, do you wanna start off or do you want? Yes, so I would like to introduce everybody again. Um, this is Koi. Uh, he is our project manager this year, um, to kind of does everything for everybody. Uh, we have Arthur uh, Perdias, who is also um, our ground station specialist and Pranav Vadi, who is our CAD and assembly specialist. Um, go ahead, it's all yours now. Okay, thank you so much for introducing me. So, you know, previously for the panel, we heard, uh, I heard some really good perspectives, um, you know, about promoting the importance of, you know, STEM education and getting more students to pursue STEM. Um, so kind of in this presentation, we wanted to discuss our own experiences, you know, being um, a team, a high school student team who built an entire CubeSat 
um, essentially without a kit from scratch. Um, so to give to give some background, um, TJ Reverb is the CubeSat. It's a two U CubeSat that was developed by TJ students um, from 2016 to 2022, and it just finished development a couple of months ago. Um, so we're going to discuss, you know, some of the challenges we face, then discuss some various technical details of Reverb to kind of give um, an overall understanding of, you know, what it takes to build one. Um, and we'll also discuss some solutions that we either implemented or recognized in hindsight. And, you know, we hope that we can inspire uh, other teams to learn from our mistakes and successes and, um, you know, further the educational reach of CubeSats. Um, so we would like to thank uh, Mario Space Technology and Thomas Jefferson Partnership Fund for their um, technical and financial support. Um, this project could not have been completed without them. Um, we would also like to thank our advisor, Kristen Kusko, um, for her amazing support as well. So this was the TJ Reverb team in 2021, kind of like during the peak of the development. This was like one year before we had to um, turn it over to NASA. So um, this is kind of the, the core development team. And we also had Jin, who isn't in this picture, unfortunately. Um, so here we have a pie chart, um, day of the life of an average high school student. Uh, as you can see, there isn't that much time to dedicate to a satellite project. Um, compared to professional and even uh, university institutions, high school students have a big disadvantage. Uh, we also have a problem of four-year turnover. So obviously high school is only four years long. So after four years, you know, the most senior members graduate um, and sometimes without passing on their knowledge. And finally, high school students obviously do not have higher education um, and have to be taught most of the required skills when they join the team, such as electronics, CAD, uh, systems engineering, and programming when they join the program. So running a high school CubeSat program is hard. From the development to the managerial aspects to the organizational aspects and everything in between, um, there's a lot of challenges associated with running a high school CubeSat program. So from here, we'd like to um, kind of, I would, I'd like to give a brief description of what Reverb is. So this is TJ Reverb. This is actually a picture without the solar panels. Um, it was from when it was in our lab a couple of months ago. Um, so we mentioned that, yeah, TJ Reverb is a TU CubeSat developed by TJ students. Um, the main scientific mission of TJ Reverb is to test uh, the Iridium radio system for communication with passive magnet stabilization. Um, we'll get more into that in a sec later in the slideshow. Um, another major component of it was educating high school students in the skills we mentioned earlier, um, such as electronics, CAD, systems engineering, um, and programming. So I think Arthur now is gonna talk a little bit more about the systems engineering aspect. Yep, starting with systems engineering, something that's fairly unique about TJ Reverb as a satellite program compared to other high school CubeSat programs is that we did not in fact use a CubeSat kit. Everything that we used were bought separately off the shelf or and were not expressly designed to work together. So we also had to design extra parts on our own to make everything work together, such as the metal connectors, which were custom milled, and our flight computer interface board, which was designed by a student at TJ. The entire stack layout was also completely designed by students, which gave a unique systems engineering aspect to this project that is different from other satellite programs. Now, Going on to the, our radio system, we utilized the Iridium radio. That was our main point of the mission to test out how this radio works with passive magnet stabilizations. So what is the Iridium radio? It is essentially a service that interfaces with a constellation of satellites, which are all in low Earth orbit, and, it's, and they send data to and from each other to all the way to a centralized ground station where the data is then forwarded out to clients through email. A process like this, um, where we use a centralized system for radio communication rather than using our own homemade um, radio system, greatly simplifies the radio communication process as we don't need to have a direct line of sight between our ground station operators and the CubeSat in order to have communication. Now I'm talking about the programming development side of TJ Reverb. Um, TJ Reverb implemented a custom flight software completely in Python utilizing the Raspbian OS on the Raspberry Pi Zero flight computer. It had to be able to leverage unique asynchronous communication process of Iridium and dynamically power cycle components depending on power consumption. 
We also had to design it to be able to handle errors that can inevitably occur in space. Finally, we defined preset modes that the satellite would switch to depending on a series of factors, such as the battery level, power generation, and the amount of data collected. We also had to write a software defined ground station to interface with the Iridium network, allowing for a custom GUI and credential system that made satellite communication effortless for our outreach partners. Electronics was one of the most time consuming subsystems on Reverb, as we had to be confident that the system was going to work as expected. It was also difficult to lay out electrical components to fit within the restrictive size constraints of a CubeSat. In the center of it all was a Raspberry Pi Zero, which was housed on the student designed interface board, allowing it to interact with the satellite through stack headers. The interface board also handled the conversion of serial protocols, such as USB to I2C, for example. We also utilize a Clyde Space Electronic Power System, EPS for short, which regulates the power of all the satellite's components. Pictured the, is the satellite in a flat sat configuration, which is when the components are connected as they would on a final satellite, but they're on a table next to each other, allowing for easy texting and debugging. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the assembly process. So when it came to assembling the CubeSat, there were many constraints we had to keep in mind to make sure that we built safely and followed guidelines. One of the most difficult things about assembly is part organization. It was very important to make sure that we had all the parts necessary and that they were all sorted in a way that would make assembly as clean and efficient as possible. Once everything was organized, we started the process of dry fitting and this is what took the longest. Um, we had to assemble everything as individual components and blocks as sh shown in the diagram previously um, to make sure that it all fits together and that it's real quick and easy to assemble everything when it comes to final as assembly. Uh, many of our parts came from different design iterations, which meant that they had to be updated, uh, remilled, remachined. Uh, once we were confident that everything was fit together properly, we began the process of final assembly by cleaning every single part with isopropyl alcohol using ultrasonic cleaner. Care was taken to keep everything under a fume hood, clean as possible. Uh, we then started assembling the blocks, taking care to secure with epoxy to prevent loosening. Everything was tightened to a specific torque specifications, connections were epoxied. Everything was built as secure as possible according to specifications that were given to us. Uh, once final assembly was complete, we assembled the complete CubeSat into a B-Pod to simulate a satellite deployer. The entire assembly was then taken to the U.S. Naval Academy for vibration testing. Vibration testing makes sure that the satellites can safely get to space without breaking or damaging other systems. There was significant paperwork involved, which is the biggest thing about CubeSats, uh, the CubeSat development process for us. Um, Every detail had to be checked according to regulations. Every result had to be checked off with the signature and time. Um, so yeah. And then we, after vibration testing, we were ready to integrate the satellite um, into the Nanorack uh, satellite deployer in Houston. So we went there earlier this year um, and got ready to be launched from the ISS. If everything goes well, it will be launched to the ISS in late November in a SpaceX Dragon capsule, and then from there into orbit. Yeah, I just want to add that it was, you know, integration was a really fun time. Um, going to NetAract was an amazing experience, and, you know, it was, I think it's a learning experience for me as well. Um, so, yeah, running a high school CubeSat program is hard, you know, as we said before. Um, so now we'd like to get into kind of the, um, solutions and um, recommended solutions, um, pulling from you know, our experiences working on this project. Um, so here are some of the successes. So outreach is a major part of our operations as a club. Events like the Small SAC Conference in Utah and presentations like this one give groups the opportunity to network with experts and gain access to more resources, one of which is funding. The benefits of outreach aren't just for the club either. Educating others is a major part of our organization. As you can see in the picture, we educate younger students about space technology and small satellites, inspiring them to explore their space interests. 
another thing that worked really well in DJ Reverb's favor was the work culture we were able to cultivate. Making a satellite is difficult. However, the, with the right community, we were able to get it done. In our community, students were highly driven and collaborative, spending hours outside of school together virtually to solve whatever problem this satellite happened to be facing at the time. Uh, another. Another thing that was very important were the mentors as, as they were instrumental in finishing TJ. Especially for high school students, professional member mentors can offer guidance when the members get stuff and offer insight into the technical and management side of things. Pictured here is um, our mentors, Jin Kang, who is, we could not have done the satellite without him. So one of the major lessons that we've learned uh, throughout the development process of uh, Reverb is documentation. Uh, one of the major issues of running a CubeSat program in high school is the four-year turnaround for members. Due to the nature of the program living inside of a high school, members can only spend up to four years in the program for graduating, which means that the skills that they gained over those years are usually lost um, and not transferred effectively over to the younger generations. Um, therefore, we discovered that proper documentation is crucial for maintaining this program's level of skill and ensuring that knowledge is transferred to new members. Uh, so following the proper development procedures is important to make effective progress on a CubeSat project. Mentors and documentation can provide insight into potential problems and help you steer clear of them, making groups more efficient with their time, money, and other resources. So a huge part of development uh, was following the most efficient path and reaching out to mentors to make sure that we were um, being efficient with our resources and with our time to make reverb uh, possible. So partnerships obviously are also essential in running high school CubeSat program uh, due to the facilities provided in high school it is impossible for high school teams to have the same access to labs and resources as college students or professional teams. However, forming partnerships can help give high school programs the resources and mentors they need to succeed. So, uh, yeah, uh, we were really grateful to have our mentors help us along the way in development. And that was a huge reason for uh, Reverb's developmental success. Okay, thank you so much, and Pranav and Arthur, for your um, comments. Um, any questions? Thank you, TJ. <clears throat> Thank you so much for um, uh, enjoying the, or being here for the round table in this presentation. We have our final break now. And then we have four outstanding presentations to close out our conference. So please stretch your legs, uh, visit the exhibitors one last time. And then when you come back, we're going to have a briefing from a high school uh, uh, CubeSat. We've got a really good company, uh, Space Loon. We're going to get a KSC outreach briefing and then Florida Atlantic University. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you